So I hope you've had a chance to read some of these, but we'll get back to it later. I'm going to make the argument today that plant breeding targets need to pretty much fundamentally change because we've accomplished a lot of the key goals over the last century. So I'll talk about what we've accomplished and what we perhaps need to change to. And so before I get into it, I want to talk about how does change happen. We start out with something we're familiar with, the shift to hybrids. Um, it was based on a technology breakthrough uh, that essentially gave a 20% increase in yields. And when it started to hit Iowa as a commercial product, it essentially swept it in about six years. And of course, these shifts aren't just with corn and agriculture. The U.S. car came in and essentially in a 10-year period replaced the horse. It destroyed numerous prior markets that had listed, lasted for millennia. And it essentially created much of the 20th century economy. The shift that we remember much more closely, of course, is the smartphone shift. Again, in the U.S., the smartphone took over the entire market in about nine years, destroyed all sorts of other technologies that had been out there, separate industries, but also created lots of other new technology areas, social waves, and even enabled remote work. So how has change impacted breeding? Well, I define breeding as the design and selection of organisms for human purposes. So while the technology and knowledge and scientific discovery around hybrid vigor really started around 1908, and, but by the time it hits the market in the 1930s, then you see this first big increase in yield, and then through iteration and breeding over the last 80 years, we've ha it resulted in this eightfold increase in maize yield, half from coming from genetics and half coming from agronomy. And that type of success has dramatically changed the shape of the United States. Ag productivity gains have essentially allowed time for modern life. The vast majority of Americans no longer live in rural environments, and only a small proportion of the U.S. now is involved in farming. That breeding success has also resulted in some ecological gains. For example, by getting those higher yields, the northern part of the U.S. now has 16% more forested land than it did in 1900, despite having much larger populations. And of course, internationally, what's happened with breeding is that now the vast majority of the globe's population has enough calories and protein. A lot of that comes from the efforts of people like Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution to deliver these changes in breeding and agronomy globally. Those were tremendous successes in the last century, but what are this century's challenges? I think our first challenge is really improving global diets. While the prior century reduced the problem of insufficient calories and protein, we still have the vast majority of the globe's population with imbalanced diets, either poor nutrition or too many empty calories. I think the vision we should be going towards is one where we've essentially eliminated everybody with insufficient calories or protein by providing access to alternative proteins and really adapting those productive row crops across the globe. And then the second area is we really need to tackle these imbalanced diets. And there we're talking about making it accessible to get to quality fruits and vegetables and all sorts of microbial foods. If we can tackle those two issues, then most of the planet will have a healthy diet by the end of the century. Our other giant challenge, of course, is dealing with climate change. That means dealing with increased temperatures. It means dealing with pests and diseases that are destroying our crops as they move into new environments. And it means dealing with extreme weather events, more floods, more droughts, and damaging wind events. But of course, plant breeding can also play a key role in ameliorating these issues. Of course, we need to come up with better abatement technologies in the production of uh, energy, but we also can play, as I'll discuss, a really key role in potentially doing carbon removal. So I think plant breeding should really be focused in on creating healthy diets, a circular agriculture, and sequestering carbon. And so why aren't we focused on these? 
I think it's because a couple other demands have really been focusing our attention. These other areas haven't been the big focus because plant breeding has been in the middle of supporting a massive seven-fold increase in protein demand uh, that's essentially stretching over 90 years. To meet this protein demand, essentially half of all habitable land on the globe is being used by agriculture. Three quarters of that ag land is for livestock and the rest of it's for crops. So essentially we're pretty much already maxed out for use of land. And the U.S. really isn't any different from the rest of the world. This is a graphic made by Bloomberg, and you can see that livestock really dominate land use across the U.S., and the proportion of area we use for food we directly eat is very modest. Even if you look at our cropland, essentially our four uh, largest production systems, wheat, hay, soybean, and corn, are really all about calories and protein, and a lot of them are all about really supporting uh, these uh, pr protein production systems. And so if you ask what is the food system's biggest challenge, it's figuring out how to get nitrogen and protein into people's diets efficiently and dealing with these increases in population. And still, many people around the globe don't have enough protein. The issue is that humans already dominate the nitrogen cycle. We control about 50% of the nitrogen flux per year. In contrast, we only control about 6% of the carbon flux per year, and yet we still have a massive problem with climate change. It's estimated that essentially half the people on the planet are here directly because of the invention of the Haber-Bosch nitrogen fixation reaction. So we are in an area with nitrogen where we're already, with our current production approaches, essentially maxed out. And so why is the system so complex? Uh, why are we using so much? Well, a lot of it is because we have a very complex system for how nitrogen gets to you. It starts out with us essentially in the United States case, drilling a hole in the ground, extracting uh, natural gas from that, creating hydrogen from that, uh, plugging that into the Haber-Bosch reaction, creating fertilizer, injecting it into the field. We hope our plants take up some of it. They're used to synthesize amino acids, which is then used for photosynthesis. It's then remobilized into the seed and we harvest it. And then we give it to our livestock. We grow those animals, we slaughter the animals, and we eat the animals. And so in each one of these steps, scientists and engineers and, uh, and business people, have, farmers have worked very hard at optimizing them. But of course, the problem is the total number of steps here. And it isn't just that the Haber-Bosch uh, has issues. It's that essentially biological, we got into the situation because biological nitrogen fixation is land inefficient. So if you compare maize yields versus soybean yields, they're grown by the same farmers on the same fields using the same equipment. And essentially maize yields about three times as much per uh, acre as uh, soybeans do. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of energy soybeans use to fix nitrogen. Globally, we face a similar type of situation, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we're expecting to have the largest population growth in the rest of the century. Essentially, in order to get Sub-Saharan Africa to be self-sufficient by 2050, we either need to vastly increase the amount of land under agriculture or vastly increase the amount of nitrogen. And that is, is the fundamental trade-off that needs to go on in order to make some of these areas across the globe self-sustaining. And I want to highlight that nitrogen, although it's critically important, it's also one of the major inputs uh, and major energy costs and major far farmer costs for, for their crops. So although maize is a very efficient crop, more than 10 to 1 energy in to energy out, over half of the energy input is coming from the nitrogen fertilizer. And if you look at the greenhouse gas emissions for a crop like maize, over 80% of its greenhouse gas emissions are coming from nitrogen. So we've talked about the weaknesses of plants, but of course, animals are actually the least efficient portion of the process. 
with beef being the most inefficient at only about 3% of efficiency, while eggs are actually quite good at 31% efficiency. But overall, animals are very inefficient at converting input protein to human consumed protein. How does nitrogen get to you? We're essentially using about 1% of the globe's energy to produce fertilizer. We lose about 50% of the nitrogen when we try to get into the plants. And then we can essentially lose anywhere from nearly 70% to 97% of that nitrogen and amino acids as we go through animal production. So I want to end here with essentially that thought experiment. How close could one get to maximal efficiency and what would that look like? Well, a single person needs about 57 grams of protein per day. And if we break that down into those amino acids that make it up, we assume we get the nitrogen through some energy process such as plasma generation of fixed nitrogen. We're then going to get the carbon from glucose, and that could come from something like maize. That works out to be about half an ear per day. And if we scale that across the globe, essentially you could feed 7.6 billion people on about 21 million hectares of land. That's about the area of Kansas, and if you look globally, essentially 1.5% of global arable land could fix all the carbon needed for the global protein demand. So on a straight chemical processing point of view, it doesn't actually take that much land to produce all of the protein necessary to support the planet. So from a straight chemistry point of view, yeah, it looks like it could be fairly straightforward to support the planet. But does any of this make economic sense? This is the type of question that Rethink X uh, was asking, and they published a report on this last year and I would highly recommend that everybody take a look at that. But their central premise is that precision fermentation, essentially the production of high quality proteins, this basic biology has really been figured out and engineering has been figured out the, over the last five or 10 years and it gets continuing to roll out. And so in the next four years, they expect those precision high quality proteins to only cost about $10 per kilogram by 2024 and down to as low as $1 per kilogram by 2035. And because of that, they expect nearly a 70% reduction in cows because essentially those production numbers are so low that these high quality proteins will outcompete animal protein in the market. They've modeled how precision protein costs have developed over time, starting with things like insulin and then industrial enzymes for cleaning and now industrial enzymes for uh, biofuels and cellulose breakdown. And now we're moving into the period where we're using these precision proteins for food production. And so what they've done here is essentially taken us to where we were a couple of years ago and essentially are modeling with scaling and improvements in, for example, new technologies like continuous flow fermentation. They expect these to continue to drop for yet another decade. One of their key predictions is that they believe that industrial products such as whey and casing, which are really chosen and used by industrial food processors, we want the first areas to be disrupted. And they are predicting that milk protein costs will essentially cross over with the whey and casein's costs in about four years from now. And because there isn't, uh, consumer preferences don't play as strong a role here, they think that this will, transition will essentially occur pretty much straight on price. The one that we probably know about more in the market is essentially fermentation-based beef. You can think of impossible burgers here, where essentially people are taking plant proteins and adding things like hemoglobin to them. Uh, there they think the prices are roughly going to cross over by 2021. And then cell-based beef, they're predicting that those uh, prices will cross over by 2025. I think the cell-based beef one is much less clear uh, as to where that one's coming in on, but essentially those are their two key predictions. And, you know, as I started out in our discussion, 
They essentially believe that they're going to try to eliminate animals uh, from the food system and that they can cut, undercut these price points dramatically relative to what you know, animal production can. And as you see, even for dairy, they hope to essentially collapse the industry. So I think the question is, are these just braggadocious claims or is there something real to it? Well, the first thing I would highlight is that essentially in the last few years, 44 alternative protein companies have already uh, been started up. And even in a year like this, uh, they're getting vast amounts of venture capital invested in. And so I want to take a look at some of the underlying assumptions behind this to see if this is at all realistic. And so what I've plotted out here is essentially the landscape of protein prices. And on the left-hand side, essentially, these are various animal proteins. Um, they're essentially their wholesale prices. And what I've uh, listed here is the cost of that item, their wholesale price, um, in dollars per kilogram of protein. So we're assuming that the only thing we're buying the item for is for its protein. In the middle, if you look below, these are pretty much the high quality plant proteins that we're used to. And then on the right hand side, essentially these are various types of feed stocks and fermentation pro uh, products that have high levels of protein in them. And I'll highlight a few things here uh, that uh, in terms of some of these costs, you know, peanuts and things like that are in the middle here. Some of you may have known I talked about mussels a while ago and they're uh, right here. They're actually the cheapest animal protein that are out there. And the final thing I want you to highlight is that the red bars are essentially what Rethink X believes these costs per proteins will be at various time points. Today is the red bar. In five years from now, they believe that precision protein will be at $10 per kilogram. And then in 15 years from now, it'll be down here. So let's start with a species I know a lot about, corn. And corn's cost of protein is a little bit above that $1 per kilogram because it's mostly a starch product. But today, a lot of that corn goes into production of ethanol and that goes on to supporting auto industry. But the residual from that is dried distillers grain. And those dried distillers grain are actually the cheapest source of protein you can buy on the planet. And so those are then fed so for example, beef, and there's essentially nearly a 65 fold difference between the cost of that protein and the cost of ground beef. And that's the fundamental aspect is that price difference between those two is where economic opportunities for precision protein comes in. So Rethink X is really predicting disruption of a couple key markets. The first one is that dairy market with casein and whey, which represent about 40% of the dairy market. And there you have nearly about a seven-fold differential in uh, ventral price. And the other market is for things like ground beef, where there's this 30-fold differential between the cost of precision protein and the cost of ground beef. Is this $1 per kilogram number even possible? And so the first thing I would highlight to you all is dried distillers grains are certainly not a refined protein, but they're already well below that price point. Soybean, you're not going to do it probably directly from soybeans. They essentially cost the same as this dollar per kilogram. Soybean meal is also probably too close in order to do it. But if you look at the cost of ammonia and sugar, or if you were to really shift it to ammonia and starch, and you had on-site production of ammonia in various aspects, you can imagine that you, your feedstocks would cost about one-eighth the cost of that refined precision protein. So I think it's certainly biochemically possible to get to this $1 per kilogram uh, price point, which could be incredibly disruptive 
to all other production systems of protein. So I think it's possible, and I think it could happen in the next 15 years. So if you go with Rethink X's estimates, you're talking about essentially massive impacts on land use and economic livelihoods. Because essentially half of all land is being used for various types of agricultural production, and the majority of that is for livestock. One way to think about this is that roughly 2 billion hectares of rangeland may no longer have a livestock market. So what would this look like for just U.S. corn and soy land? Well, there would likely be a massive drop in the need for livestock feed by mid-century. Processed food might slightly go up in order to support some of these systems. And industrial carbon would likely go up substantially in order to support things like plastic. But still, nearly half of the acreage would not be needed to support current markets. So this could either go into ecosystem services, which I'll talk about more later, or the land could go compete in things like the wheat market. But if it competed in the wheat market, this is enough land that essentially it could produce half of the globe's total wheat need and would likely displace other producers around the globe that were less efficient. So what then would be the risk for smallholders in rural communities globally? Well, you could imagine dairy markets pretty much disappearing, land values crashing, and essentially meat markets may be cut in half. And so those are all really big issues for how we support and think about uh, these types of transitions that I think could potentially come. So in the case of smallholders, how could they take advantage of these types of changes? Well, one way to kind of think about it is this precision fermentation systems are really microbrewery scale fermenters. And they're maybe on the scale enough to support 1,000 to 10,000 people. And they can produce a wide range of different products, everything from beer uh, to precision protein, to water-soluble vitamins, to lipid-soluble vitamins, to really support most of some of the key needs and nutrients that people need. And the inputs are relatively simple, things like maize or cassava, um, and then ammonia either coming from the Haber-Bosch reaction or from electric arc type reactions. So how could some smallholders take advantage of these changes? Well, currently, most of the nitrogen that is used for things like crop is coming by intercropping from legumes and other types of biological nitrogen fixation. But if we imagine that essentially we're shifted over to a world where maybe we're having low protein maize, we may be able to actually recycle some of that nitrogen and increase nitrogen levels in the soil. And then additionally, reduced animal consumption of stover could both enhance carbon and uh, soil nitrogen. And so then you're getting starch and oil from crops like maize and uh, protein from intercrop legumes. And then you're getting additional protein and additional nutritional balance from these microbrewery type of approaches. They're being driven from the starch in these various crops. So I think although that we're talking about lots of instability, there are some positives that you could see for smallholders. Potentially greater food security and nutrition, micro markets and co-op fermenters, potentially better soils, and higher crop yields due to better nitrogen balance in soils. So currently I think we're at a place where plant breeding could be focused on these things, but I think we really should be focused in on healthy diets, a circular agriculture, and sequestering carbon. So let's first turn to healthy diets. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because I think a lot of people in our community know a lot more about how to do this than I. But essentially, I think we should really be breeding for both flavor, nutrient, and controlled environments. Whether that's Michael Mazurik's mini butternut squash, Mike Gore's work in uh, producing high protein vitamin A, uh, 
or Neil Matson and colleagues working on controlled environments. I think these are all really key areas where we should be targeting or bridging towards in order to create a much wider, better set of products coming out of each of these environments. So this is where I think in new efforts like USDA, Screen Insight can be a really a great key partner in helping us breed for things like flavor, nutrient, and controlled environments. And I know ARS and Moira uh, want to make this a high priority, and I hope we can all work together towards those goals. The next area that Plant Breeding should really focus on is circular agriculture. And so when we talk about circular nutrient economies, what we're talking about is taking the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that we certainly need for growth of our plants to produce the food and everything, and essentially just reducing it and keeping more of the nitrogen on farm and remobilizing it through the year. So we don't need as much nitrogen to be brought onto the farm each year. And just a reminder, in the case of maize, for example, over 80% of those greenhouse emissions are coming from nitrogen. And then we have issues such as runoff going into things like the Gulf of Mexico. Nearly 60% of the nitrogen in the Gulf of Mexico is coming from agriculture. And these loss of nutrients is an economic loss to the farmers and it's an environmental cost. So one of the big targets we need to focus on in plant breeding is really breeding for entire agroecosystems. Cover crops and perennials we know if we combine them and an integrated breeding and management can really improve both soil biology, nutrient cycling, drought, and flood tolerance. And I think a lot of these tools we're talking about can be brought together in order to rapidly breed for cover crops to support a lot of our major row crops and make them much more uh, circular. But I also want us to think in other ways about how we can create a circular agriculture. Fall colors are a reminder of how perennials are recycling nitrogen and phosphorus. The reason we're seeing those colors is they've already moved all their nitrogen and phosphorus out of the leaves and are saving that for the next year. Which of these strategies can we borrow for agriculture? We've been thinking about concepts, for example, about low protein maize, where if you look at a maize ear, there's, while it's not high in protein, because its yield is so high, there's nearly 800 kilograms per hectare of protein in a maize field. And if you think about that, that's this, roughly the same amount of protein that's in 14 head of steer. So what if we were able to kind of save that back into the ground or reuse it somehow for the coming year? Could we drop the protein down where it's not really being used very effectively and save it for the next year? And that's fundamentally the question that Travis Rooney has been asking in our group. He's been wondering, can we make annuals more like perennials? And if you look at the conventional maize variety, we take lots of nitrogen and phosphorus, we add it to our plants, and we get both volatilization and runoff of these. And so we get big losses of nitrogen and phosphorus there. And then we pick up the grain, and uh, we use a lot of the starch, and there's some uses for the protein, but for example, we have too much phosphorus in our pig lagoons and so on. And he's asked the, the simple question, well, can we use that nitrogen and phosphorus, of course, during the growing season, but then leave it in the cobs and not leave, put it in the kernels, and essentially then recycle those cobs each year so that essentially we take off the starch, but we've really focused on recycling the nitrogen and phosphorus for the coming year. And we've already talked about circular agriculture, and that can play an important ro role in reducing greenhouse gases. And it plays a role in this top part of the graph, uh, where it's either, whether it's energy production or all sorts of other approaches, uh, we need to really reduce uh, total CO2 outputs. Fertilizer production requires 1% of the globe's energy. The nitrous oxide coming off our crops are a major greenhouse gas. And uh, there's greater uh, and greater efficiency here is a double win for both farmers and uh, the environment. So I'd like to now turn to what could plant breeding do to really sequester carbon? 
by the end of the century, we need to develop plants that would be sequestering about 20 gigatons of CO2 per year. There are a number of important industrial sectors that will still require carbon compounds for decades to come. These need to be serviced first in order to eliminate the use of fossil fuels before we focus solely on carbon sequestration. So I think there's three main areas where plant breeding can play a role. Some of those are we're already doing right now, and that's like ethanol production to replace gas. And, you know, these can be efficient approaches if we refine them with solar and wind. Our plants can also be base polymers for plastics. Again, if we solar and wind energy is used to process them. And then finally, uh, our plants and our grasses can be used for deep carbon uh, sequestration. So I want to remind everyone that plants are quite competitive in terms of straight energy. On a dollar per joule basis, they're much better than wind or even natural gas. And this is where I think we need to also look more carefully at ethanol production and ask really why is it not as efficient as we would like it to be. Growing and transporting maize is really not the problem. It's a relatively minor part of the total amount of non-renewable energy that goes in. Rather, it's the ethanol conversion, especially the distillation of it. And this is where I think we should view ethanol more like hydrogen. It's really an electron carrier, and we should use it and process it with solar or wind energy to convert it into a form that we can use as a liquid fuel. But it has, of course, the major advantages relative to hydrogen of already working with the established market. So before we start sequestering carbon, I think we need to make sure we're dealing and have carbon neutral fuels and plastics. I would imagine, for example, the transportation sector, yes, it will quickly in the next few decades maybe convert to 75% electricity, but it may still require about a quarter of it, some kind of liquid fuel. And things like maize could essentially service it quite well. Plastics, again, we need to eliminate fossil fuels there, and there you could shift to essentially 100% renewable with about 10 million hectares of maize. And as a, a really nice article by Posen a couple of years ago highlighted, uh, you could really go greenhouse gas negative if you combined it with renewable processing. And for both of these areas, it's really about the processing that's key. So now let's turn our attention to sequestering carbon. Fundamentally, how do we pull 10 to 20 gigatons of CO2 from the air? Well, we do it all the time. It's called photosynthesis. And if you look at photosynthesis uh, by ecosystem, essentially across the globe, it's nearly 450 gigatons per year are being pulled out of the atmosphere. And if you divide through those estimates from what the National Research Council was estimating to require, it's about 2% by 2050 and 4% of that global photosynthesis uh, by 2100. And so those numbers don't seem very big. But then you start to realize, well, we really only manage a much smaller proportion of those environments. And if you look at the ecosystems that we manage, then you start talking about much larger numbers. You're talking about using 5.7 and a little over 11% of the photosynthetic capacity to sequester carbon. And now there's no way we could really do this if protein were competing for the exact same land. And so this is where I think those discussions we had previously on what's the nature of protein production across the globe likely to be over the coming decades is really important. It's essentially the same land is needed for both purposes. So as a reminder, you know, perennial grasses out there already sequester carbon and they grow very differently from a lot of our annual crops. In the picture on the left, what you see is a, peren a native perennial grass relative to annual wheat. Um, and as you can tell, they grow very differently in terms of the root structure and everything else. But the question is, can we shift where they're putting some of their carbon at the end of the year?
And uh, this is where I think there's an opportunity for plant breeding really to develop deep, persistent carbon. And that could happen both in our, some of our annuals and our, our perennials. And if it's accompanied with many of the other optimizations we've already been talking about, the overall harvest uh, yield loss to above ground barn may be modest. Uh, turn to our model maize and ask the question, what would carbon sequestered maize look like? Well, in a highly productive maize crop, about five tons of carbon is left every year in the stover, and about we pull off about five tons in terms of the harvested kernels. If we're willing to essentially to create a maize plant that, say, lost 10% of its yield, and maybe is somewhat shorter, we may be able to essentially move essentially an additional ton of carbon every year down at deeper in the soil profile. Now, I do want to highlight that, just as we heard last week from our soil science colleagues, deep carbon alone is likely not enough. Carbon really needs to be mineralized to be able to stay there for hundreds or thousands of years. And so when we talk about that, we talk about complexing that carbon with something like magnesium or calcium and getting it deep. And so the questions I think we have on the basic research side is how do we combine some of these things we could do with plants with how do we work with soil scientists on figuring out how to mineralize it. So if we were to able to sequester 20% of the biomass to each of these areas, across the United States, you start counting up that a substantial number of gigatons uh, of CO2 be, could be sequestered uh, every year. And that totals up to about 2.9 gigatons per year, uh, which is about 14% of the global target. And if you think about it in terms of dollar terms, a lot of people are assuming that carbon could be priced at nearly uh, $50 per ton of CO2. That would be essentially an equivalent to about $142 billion market by the end of the century uh, for carbon sequestration. So I think there are, are, as you see, a range of different ways we can go about using plant breeding to tackle uh, the, the giant problems of carbon sequestration. But just to give it a little frame of reference, essentially if you compare the pro size of the problem of food production versus carbon agriculture just in straight amount of carbon, carbon sequestration is about a six-fold larger problem than feeding people. So this is a big problem, and we're going to need to use a lot of different tools. So what should plant breeding be focused on? Well, I think it's really about healthy diets, circular agriculture, and about sequestering carbon. But if you ask what our biggest challenge is during the 21st century in breeding, it's really figuring out how to solve both these goals, which I think we can really do, but we really need to be thoughtful in planning and work with consumers, farmers, and the environment to work through these massive transitions. Because none of these transitions are going to be small or easy. So I thank you very much and I'd be happy to take some questions.